thank you. Would you join me in welcoming these campus guests? And I will turn it over at this point to Red McCall. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Red McCall. I am the president of Oklahoma Atheists. We are the fifth largest atheist community meetup group in the world. Out of 860 meetup groups that are atheists, we are the fifth largest. So that's 1,800 members here uh, in the Oklahoma City area uh, and in surrounding cities. Uh, we have up to 30 different meetups a month. So we're we're really, really busy group, anything from social, political, to uh, um, social, political, education, parenting, um, outreach, volunteering. We, we have meetups for a lot of different types of people and all over the, all over the calendar. Um, I'd like to give a couple of thank yous to Oklahoma State Secular Organization, uh, the Native American Student Association, uh, OSU Navigators, as well as RZIM for allowing us to be here today and, and sending two of their best I don't have a good accent, but they have awesome accents, so you'll get to hear a lot of that. Uh, the debate came together. We set out about a year ago to basically just kind of have this, this kind of a conversation. It's not a typical debate where, you know, it's an Oxford style, people get your opinions beforehand, and then we figure out if you change your opinion. It's really just an informative type discussion between uh, the gentleman with RZIM and Oklahoma Atheists. Um, just trying to figure out how we can be civil, how we can get along with one another, uh, to get rid of a lot of the stigma associated with not being Christian. You know, it's obviously a very Christian state. You'll hear many things tonight uh, that you might not have heard before, so I urge a lot of people to Google a lot of different terms that you hear. If there's something that's confusing, maybe something that you were unsure about, just please get online, try to search, see if you can find information that either supports it and information that doesn't support the claim. And that's just being a good skeptic and knowing how to look at information. Um, just different ways to ask yourself whenever you're going to different websites, uh, how does this website benefit from the information that they're providing me? So, in a sense, don't get your cancer facts from the tobacco industry. Uh, please understand tonight, we're going to be talking about some very personal things. Um, a lot of people in the audience here have a personal relationship with God, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no way to really have this kind of a conversation without people that are listening getting offended. There's, it's just, it's impossible. Um, many of you are going to say, why are you speaking this way about my God, about my Jesus? I understand. I used to be a Christian myself, so I, I just want to apologize in advance. We're not up here to try to offend anybody. Uh, we're also here to dispel a lot of rumors about atheists, um, whether it's that we're evil people, that we're sad people. Um, being an atheist is a very hard standpoint to have. There's an overwhelmingly majority in the state that are Christian, and being an atheist is basically saying that you think the other people are wrong. But it's the same standpoint as a person that's a Muslim, as a Hindu, as a Native American spiritualist, uh, looking at Christianity. So it, it's, it's a very difficult standpoint because the rest of the world, as you know, is very religious. Now, the percentage of people that are secular, meaning no, no religion whatsoever, or even people that claim to be atheists, is a pretty small percentage in compared to the rest of the, of the world that do believe in some kind of higher power, some kind of God. So being in my standpoint, it's very difficult. Um, if I was a Hindu, it might end up being a little bit better of a conversation because it would be a conversation of telling the other person um, the different proofs that would be saying that you are, that your religion is correct over the other one. But I'm saying I haven't been convinced. So kind of going to the next thing, I'm an atheist. I've been an atheist for quite a while. I used to be a Christian. Um, I'm not an atheist because I'm mad at God. I've, I'm an atheist because I've failed to be convinced. I am a blank slate in that sense. I'm very, very open to any kind of evidence, any kind of proof, any kind of, well, like I said, evidence that would lead me to a conclusion. But unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any. So. Um, like I said, uh, discussions like this can be very difficult whenever it comes to my standpoint of being an atheist. Like I said, once again, I'm just an open slate, so hopefully through the end of the year we can be able to have a little bit more information that's out there, some different things that maybe I can go home and Google and maybe cha even change my mind. Um, to kind of talk about what it is to be a believer, to be somebody that does believe in a higher power, that is called a theist. I'm an atheist. 
So it's much like saying typical versus atypical or symmetrical versus asymmetrical. It's a name, atheist is a name for something that I'm not. Um, much like I'm also a non-smoker. So kind of the same idea with that. Um, except I'm not an atheist because I'm mad at God. I can't stress that enough. That seems to be a prevailing thing. I am just, I'm happy. I lead a good life. I'm moral. I have fun with other people and I value community. I just don't necessarily follow a higher power, you know? So that's something I can't stress enough with that. Um, in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus said, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do unto you, for this sums up the law of the prophets. Now, both atheists and theists can agree that Jesus said quite a few good things in the Bible, um, especially about humility, uh, charity, compassion. However, the golden rule is not specific to Christianity. You can get, there's a poster that's out there. It actually is hanging up in the United Nations, and it's the golden rule poster. There's a Google term. Um, It actually features 13 different religions throughout the world, each of them having the golden rule as one of their tenets. Now, some of those religions predate Christianity. Some of them are geographically isolated away from Christianity. So the idea is, is if it didn't come from Christianity, because obviously either separated by time or by distance, then where did it come from? Well, I'm of the mindset that it's, it's a more of a human moral code. It's a really good lesson to live by. Um, so that's, like I said, please Google the, the golden rule poster. Now, with the golden rule, there... Treat other people like you want to be treated. And the message that I can say to both atheists and theists is just treat everybody the way that you would personally want to be treated with that. Um, Both want the best whenever we're having conversations. If you're having a conversation with a theist or having a conversation with an atheist, that just listen, don't be rude, don't be pushy, treat them exactly the way you want to be treated, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing up here tonight. It's not not a contest. Um, You have to keep in mind that 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 People aren't going to just change their minds right then. So pushing that hard is not not the thing you need to do. Give people a chance to do their own research, and they'll convince themselves or not convince themselves. So we're atheists, uh, to the atheists here, um, Christians aren't dumb. Not saying all of you think that that, that's the way or, or anything like that. And same thing for Christians. Atheists aren't dumb. We're not lost. We're not misguided. Same thing for the Christians. So... If we kind of come at it that way and try to think that it's that we're on the same page and that we're both intelligent people, we've you know, and the atheists have just failed to be convinced. Both of us have knowledge that we want to share with each other, and once again, that's what you'll see up here tonight. So, um, not judging each other, not doing anything like that. Uh, I can't say. One of the things I would like to point out also is that not to judge atheists or even judge theists or anybody else based off of your interactions with some of them, people are jerks. Jerks represent a lot of different people in a lot of different religions. So if you end up having one conversation with one atheist one time and that guy was a jerk, that doesn't represent all of us. Same thing with Christians. Having that one person doesn't represent the whole majority of uh, the whole of the entire religion. So don't judge us based off of Stalin. We won't judge you based off of Westboro Baptist. I think everybody kind of agree that they're jerks. And so that's kind of, that's kind of the point I wanted to make with, uh, with that. Um, so some of the questions that will probably end up coming up tonight and showing that we are on the same page is, where did this all come from? Where did we all come from? It's a very common question that atheists specifically get. And the, I'm very happy with saying, I don't know. You know I, I, do, I do believe that the Big Bang provides some evidence. There's a lot of gaps in knowledge. What came before the Big Bang is the common question. I don't know. We don't know if we even have a way to figure that out. Oddly enough, the same question can also be applied to Christians. Because where did everything come from? God. Well, what came before God? Did God have a father? Did God, uh, how old is God? Does he have a belly button? So a lot of different fun little questions like that. Um, Regardless of how it all came into being, we can all see that the world is beautiful and that you should treat everybody the way that you want to be treated. And um, it doesn't really matter how it was created. Um, That kind of knowledge might come, it might not come. So we don't know. So hopefully by the end of this discussion, we'll we'll have a little bit more civility. People can talk with each other. Hopefully by the end of the night, you'll be able to have conversations with other Christians or other uh, atheists or anybody else that's in the room of, of any other kind of religion and hopefully make some friends tonight. So thank you.
Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mike, for your introduction. Red, thank you uh, for your opening speech. And thank you, all of you, uh, for giving up uh, an evening uh, to be with us here. And the first thing I have to say is I do not know what accent everyone is alluding to. It is you people who have an accent. To me, uh, this, uh, this is normal. But um, obviously, I have a lot of learning uh, to do. It's um, a pleasure to be, uh, to be with you here at Oklahoma uh, State University this evening. As uh, Mike said in his introduction, I'm British by origin, but now a confused Canadian. Uh, I live in Toronto and I'm still learning my way around North America. So this is my first, uh, first visit to Oklahoma. And uh, trust me, when you've left minus 20 degrees in Toronto, what you have here is near to heaven on earth. So uh, enjoy it. Um, I'd also like to uh, also add my note of thanks to the thanks that have already been said to everyone who made um, this evening possible. There's an awful lot of work has gone into making uh, this evening happen. It's easy for the five of us to sit up here and, uh, and make it all look amazing, but actually without the folks behind the scenes and at the university. Uh, so thank you to everyone uh, who's made it possible. Well, by way of uh, introduction, I think it's important to note, isn't it, as Mike said in his introduction, as Red has just shared, that tonight's topic is a vital one. Tonight's topic is an essential one, given the fact that we live in an increasingly pluralistic society. I, uh, I live in Toronto, as I said, one of the most multicultural cities uh, on planet Earth, where you can choose quite literally from an A to Z of different religions, ideologies, and belief systems. Everything literally from atheism to Zoroastrianism. We have the entire uh, range, those belief systems all jostling alongside each other for attention. Now, of course, what's interesting is just a few generations ago, many secular writers believed that religion uh, would soon disappear. It would be replaced by a kind of secular utopia. We now realize how uh, naive that was. We live, as one journalist put it recently, in the age of religion. While organized religion may be, uh, may be on the wane in some places, certainly the number of people identifying as spiritual, uh, whatever that means, it means different things to different people, is on the rise everywhere. At the same time, my atheist friends like Red and others are uh, increasingly confident and are beginning to organize. So it's amazing that statistic you shared that you're number five on the, on the list. So, you know, with some work, maybe you can work your way up the ranking. Uh, there, but so that's pretty amazing. Atheist groups are beginning uh, to organize, often in some places along uh, similar lines uh, to religion. It's been interesting to see some of that cultural trend going on. If you look at the popularity of books like Alain de Botton's uh, Religion for Atheists, or in London last year, the first atheist church uh, was launched. They call themselves the Sunday Assembly. Launched in London, has taken off to huge success, and they're planting now into Canada and, uh, and North America. They call themselves an atheist church. It's a fascinating movement to observe. Well, all of that rich diversity, of course, raises tonight's question with ever-increasing urgency, doesn't it? How can we live together despite our differences? How can we debate and discuss uh, with civility without dinging one another around the head. Well, I was recently speaking at uh, the University of Victoria uh, in British Columbia on Canada's west coast. And it was an interesting lecture because while I was speaking, uh, a young student sitting at the back of the auditorium uh, was gest uh, gesticulating wildly during my talk. Every time I made a point, he kind of waved his arms around like this. It was very clear that he disagreed with everything I said. At the end of the talk, we had a Q&A. He came to the microphone, self-identified as an atheist, and then proceeded to ask a series of increasingly complex uh, questions about moral philosophy. And then afterwards, he sought me out, and we debated at the front of the lecture room for about half an hour on a whole range of issues. You know, what does the good life look like? Does atheism lead to nihilism? And so on. For 30 minutes, to and fro, we went. Finally, he had to go. And he shook my hand and he said, Andy, thank you for today. Uh, it's been the most fascinating 90 minutes I've had for the last two or three years. Disagreed with everything you've said, but it's been one of the best conversations I've had uh, on campus here. You've given me much to think about. Now, as I reflected on, on that conversation with my, with, my, with my now friend, I found myself thinking that deeply encouraged me. It encouraged me because in some senses it's rarer than I wish it was. Because often what happens when people with wildly different views uh, meet and engage with each other, the result can be more heat than light. Sometimes atheists resort to argument based by soundbite. Sometimes, re sometimes religious believers dismiss our atheist friends as immoral pagans, and we just simply yell at each other. Well, I'm British, as you will have detected, and thus I'm naturally wired to be a pessimist. Um, <laughs> but that said, 
I'm optimistic that it is possible to dialogue sensibly and civilly. In fact, I've just flown in uh, from Istanbul, so if I look slightly sort of, uh, sort of dazed this evening, it's because I'm on six hours ahead of your time zone here. And in Istanbul, I spoke at an Islamic university and I had a fascinating dialogue there with faculty and uh, with students, and we were able to have a respectful dialogue uh, without it descending to blows. Nobody took to Twitter afterwards to insult the other side. And I found myself thinking, if that's possible, in somewhere as politically charged as Istanbul, where East and West quite literally meet, then surely it has to be possible uh, here in somewhere like North America. So how do we engage civilly, yet meaningfully, in a pluralistic society? Let me very quickly, as my, in the last of my time, share with you five principles that I've learned in 20 years of dialoguing uh, with atheists and, uh, and Muslims on three continents now. Five principles, very quickly, that I found helpful. Number one. Recognize that we all hold beliefs and we hold them dearly. I think what sometimes leads to argument rather than to dialogue is when one side in a debate, debate tries to claim that their position is not actually a belief. Rather, I think dialogue begins by recognizing something that the French uh, feminist philosopher uh, Julia Kristeva once observed. She wrote, when I say I believe, what I mean is I hold to be true. And the thing is, every single one of us here this evening, all of us on the panel, all of you out there in the audience, all of us have beliefs. All of us have a worldview. And dialogue is only possible when we actually begin explaining what we do believe, not just attacking the other side. And it's very easy as a Christian to spend all of my time attacking atheists. It's easy for atheists to spend all of their time attacking Christians. You see, any fool can tear down what somebody else believes. Dialogue begins when you actually explain what you do believe and then allow the other side to do the same. Secondly, show generosity to the other side. Be willing to listen to those who profoundly disagree with what you believe. Try not to misrepresent them. Two really good contemporary examples of this. The uh, Pathios.com website uh, recently reported online the story of Tim Mayhall, a Christian chaplain at an Alabama uh, hospital who is working really hard to help develop chaplaincy services for the atheist and humanist community who are often denied access to that. And he's going the extra mile to try and help them do that, even though they disagree profoundly with what he believes. That's from the Christian side. An example from the atheist side, one of my favorite European journalists is a journalist named Matthew Paris, very famous British journalist, very well-known atheist. Well, a few years ago, he wrote a very influential article called, As an Atheist, Why I Believe Africa Needs God in which he describes his journey, his travels through Malawi and Africa, and the positive difference that he'd seen Christian faith make. You see, it takes generosity to be a Matthew or a Tim, because often your own community can turn on you and say, why on earth have you said that and been so kind about the other side? Show generosity to those even who you disagree with. Thirdly, take accountability for your words and be open to critique. A good example of this concerns social media. If we're genuine about debate and civility, we need to make sure that we demonstrate that what we say, both offline, but especially in this age of the digital age, online, is respectful. I often say to Christian audiences when I speak in churches that one of the best ways to avoid the charge of hypocrisy that is sometimes leveled at Christians and those who don't share your faith is to challenge them to, if they see a disconnect between what you believe and what you live, between what you say you believe and what you say, then invite your friends to point it out and to haul you up on it. In other words, be transparent, be open to critique. And if we speak the language of dialogue and civility, but for example, our social media feed, our Facebook page is full of ridicule and insult, then we should invite people to critique us and ask us how serious we are. Be people who are transparent. Fourthly, penultimately, reflect on our shared humanity. Dialogue begins, I believe, when we recognize that despite our differences, atheist and Christian, we are all human. Of course, as my Oxford colleague Os Guinness once remarked, to be fully human, he said, we need to know what humanness is. Now that insight suggests to me that the primary question that may divide us this evening, and we can explore this as the discussion goes, is perhaps not do you believe or disbelieve in God? That's often the question that we talk about in these kind of forums. But actually, I wonder if the primary question is what do you think it means to be human? 
Are we just tormented atoms in a bed of mud, as Voltaire memorably suggested? Or are we more than this? You see, I suspect that unless we have a concrete foundation for why human beings have a right to their beliefs, why would they have a right to be treated civilly and with respect no matter what they believe, unless we have that foundation, freedom may very quickly descend into insult. And then finally, finally, dialogue requires a commitment to the importance of truth. I hope for each one of us, I'm sure it is for each one of us on the panel here this evening, our primary concern is not cheap polemics or point scoring, but with what is true. Now, when it comes to worldviews, of course, how do we know what is true? Well, determining truth takes hard work and a willingness to engage, I believe, on three levels, the intellectual, the existential, and the pragmatic, how our ideas work out in the real world outside these doors. One of my favorite places uh, in the world is a, a place called Speaker's Corner in, uh, in London, England, uh, part of Hyde Park in London. It's affectionately known as the world center of free speech. Anybody can stand on a ladder at Speaker's Corner and you can talk about anything and you can draw a crowd. I first learned public speaking at Speaker's Corner and I found it a wonderful environment to learn to dialogue and debate and engage with, uh, with Marxists, with Muslims, with atheists, with people of all beliefs and none. But Speaker's Corner taught me a really important lesson, I believe. It taught me this, human beings are not going to agree on everything. Human beings are not going to agree on everything. The major worldviews disagree on most of the important questions. However, I believe that it, despite our differences, that it is only through civil dialogue and debate that we can be encouraged to think deeply and stretched to consider the challenges to the things that we hold dear and ensure that there are really good reasons why we believe them. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian writer imprisoned by Stalin for his beliefs, was fond of this old proverb. One word of truth, he said, outweighs the whole world. One word of truth outweighs the whole world. America is increasingly pluralistic. Some people look at that pluralism and think that the way to deal with difference is to rudely challenge, squash all competing worldviews. Others think we should collapse all the differences and declare truth is relative. But I think the way to a peaceful society lies down no, neither of those paths, not least because truth is too important to reduce to power plays or to relativism. Perhaps if we can learn to listen and dialogue, what we can instead find is ways to live together, despite our different perspectives. Thank you. Two fine, clear opening statements, and now let me just turn to the panel in general and say, gentlemen, anyone who would like to respond or you want to open a new conversation stream, feel free to do that. Do De Clayton or Stuart want to say anything? Because they've so far been silent. <clears throat> I wanted to, um, to talk to you a little bit about, I, I know that that's a common uh, discussion in Christianity, particularly in the apologist communities, to talk about, um, uh, and you, you might have tonight, the worldview question. And, and to frame it within the context of um, uh, the Christian worldview, the Islamic worldview, the, uh, and, the, and the atheist worldview. Um, I know a lot of atheists like to push back against that. I'm actually not too bothered by it, um, because I think that if you're, maybe not as an individual atheist, but as a, um, uh, as a community, naturalism, not necessarily materialism, i will be happy to discuss the difference between the two if anyone wants to bring it up in the Q&A. Um, there is a naturalistic project within philosophy, and that is something that the atheist, at least the philosophers are, are, are in the process of doing, and I know that the critique of that is going to come from the religious side, and it's important that that happens. So, um, both, and, and from other atheists as well. But, uh, so I know that I mean, you, t you guys, I I've looked at some of your videos and things, and, some, and one of the things that I know that a lot of apologists like to talk about is, is the coherency and consistency of the atheist worldview. And um, there's, and, and you, you talked about uh, belief being, you know, a stance on something that you hold to be true. A lot of 
a lot of people who are non-religious or atheists like to say that um, you know atheism is a lack of a belief, um, and that can only get you so far. Um, if you genuinely care about what is true, then it's important that you, you know, try to try to find out what science says about the way the world is and what is philosophically coherent. Uh, and I think that atheism is philosophically coherent. I don't have a problem with 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 taking that stance. But um, I know that the, the critique of that is important, so I think it's a, there's a good place for that to happen in, phil in philosophy. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a, an accent as well. I'm from Georgia, so I speak like a southerner. Uh, um, I'm still learning how to talk right. It's not working very well. <laughs> Now, I really appreciate what you're, you were saying about um, our perspectives and, and beliefs. And sometimes when we're trying to, to describe perspectives of how people see reality, we need systems. And these are tools, as long as we realize that the person, the belief, the idea is always more than the system. That's a descriptive tool. But I think sometimes, I mean, I think that what we all share in common is that we're, we're interested in reality. That's what we're all looking for. We want to know what is the really real. We're in the matrix if you like, and we're trying to you know, find out what's the really real red pill, blue pill, whatever, um, and go down the rabbit hole into Kansas. Um, but the search and the hunger is to try to find it. So when we look at other world, world systems, at some point we're all living in making judgments about reality. We're trying to find out what's the nature of reality. I was raised um, in a, my, my father was a Fabian socialist, if that would be kind of the word they would use in Britain post-war army gen or military generation in Britain. We were, it was basically secular. Religion was passed at sell by date in, in Scotland. I was not interested in that at all. So the God question was not something that I was you know, dealing with in, in that sense, but I was dealing with questions of existence. So when Christianity came to, into my world or where the God question, it reformed and reframed my worldview by changing what I thought reality was. And so to me, it's, more than, it's not just a philosophical question. And that's the same because I read as you were telling about, you know, that you had been raised a Christian, you had walked away from it and that. And I'm, I know there's probably good reasons behind that. We'd love to, and we'll hear probably. But the idea that what we're talking about tonight is how we, we understand what reality is, how we listen to someone else describe their view of reality, and how do we adjudicate between these views when all of us have to make judgments. And I think partly that's what the conversation's about. That, as you said, there are reasons why we believe and there are reasons why, clearly why you don't believe. And I think those reasons are the things at times worth exploring. If you'd like to know more about this ministry or would like to donate to our efforts, you can call us at 1-800-448-6766 or visit us online at rzim.org. Our mailing address is RZIM, P.O. Box 921-939, Norcross, Georgia 30010.